and the winner of the 2012 John Newbery Medal for the most distinguished contribution to literature for children is Dead End in Norval by Jack Gantos. <laughs> Published by Farrah Strauss Giroux, edit, excuse me, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group, edited by Wesley Adams. <laughs> With a perfect blend of history and humor, Jack Gantos invites us to join him for a summer of nosebleeds, Hell's Angels, Girl Scout cookies, melted paraffin, and old lady deaths. Set in 1962 in the New Deal town of Norville, Pennsylvania, the story is full of unexpected twists, mysterious happenings, and fully realized, often feisty characters. Whether he's plowing down his mother's cornfield, helping his dad dig a bomb shelter, typing obituaries for Miss Volker, or saving a deer from imminent death, that Gantos boy is nothing if not endearingly hard pressed. <laughs> for sharing with us both your remembered and your imagined boyhood, for showing us both the tough and the tender sides of young Jack's personality, and for reminding us that there is nothing quite as engaging as unabashed eccentricity. Jack Gantos, please come forward to receive the 2012 Newbery Medal for Dead End in Norville. It was terrific. It was, uh, I loved it. Let me get this out here. You know, you just have to get the range of the room, you know, and it's, it's pretty rangy. <laughs> I think I know about 50% of the people in this room, and it's good to be among friends. Thank you very much. Okay. You know, there are just so many titles you can give a speech. But I think this sort of speech uh, calls for thank yous up front. So it's kind of like an evening of thank yous, I would think. Um, and uh, so I'll start there. That's just where I'm going to start. I, I have a lot of thank yous to give. And it seems like uh, since January, I've been walking in the men's rooms all over the world, looking in the mirror and saying, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And trying my best, you know, not to be smarmy sounding, not to be, you know, condescending, not to be casual about it, but to really try and find a sincere tone. And it really seems to be escaping me. And I mean, I can't even thank myself properly. So I'm trying. So if, if, if you don't feel like I'm taking this seriously, really, I am. I am. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, everybody who knows me, which, as I said, we're a lot of people, um, know that I'm a very conventional person. I'm just totally... <laughs> what you see is what you get. So that's what you're going to get. So... Um, First, naturally, in the cycle of life, you, you thank your wife. You absolutely thank your wife. And I, I thank my wife uh, every day, ever supportive, um, and, and just wonderful. And uh, that heart of hers is like a treasure chest of new berries. And uh, I know that sounds glib, doesn't it? And, and it's not meant to sound glib, honey. Very sincere. And then I have to thank my daughter, Mabel, of course. Um, 
Mabel, who's far more clever than her father and uh, who takes the high road when it comes to not being harsh toward her father's speeches, especially when she has a leading role in this one. Oh, yes, that's forthcoming. <laughs> my speech is escaping me. Um, I also wish to say thank you to my publisher. My publisher of FSG, Macmillan, I could not be at a better place, and I've been there for an awful long time, it seems, and I'm so thrilled to be with them, and thank you so much for all of your support. It really means the world to me. It does, see? I, mean, you know, I can't say anything without it sounding smarmy. My editor, my editor is Wes Adams, long-standing editor. I've worked with Wes for 20 years, uh, worked with him as part of it, fenced would be part of it, sparred would be part of it, and uh, we have sustained each other, I think, for all 19 publications that we've gone through, from picture books to collections of short stories to novels, and even a truly non-fiction memoir, that one, truly non-fiction memoir, the most stolen book in America, I'm proud of that, um, non-fiction memoir in which the main criminal character certainly is Jack Gantos, and, uh, and I just found out, this is just the most remarkable thing to me, I just found this out, that, uh, I mean, I have to read it again because it's not really, it doesn't make any sense, but, but Daniel Radcliffe, some people may know him. Daniel Radcliffe has just purchased the film rights to Hole in My Life. And could you imagine Daniel Radcliffe playing me? I love that. You know? Get out there and do it, Danny. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the surprises in life just keep on coming. I'd also like to say a, a very dear thank you to my agent, Amy Burkauer, ever insightful, hardworking, always charming, um, who is the chairwoman of Writer's House in New York, and she is brilliant and lovely and a real bookish person. Okay, and finally, with great fanfare, great fanfare, right? I'd like to say, I'd like to say and express my gratitude to ALSK, ALA, and of course, Vicki Ash, I mean, really, without a chairwoman, where would we be? And, uh, and the entire Newberry Committee, thank you all very much for all of your diligent committee members. Um, all of them who met probably in a very secretive scrum. You could just imagine them all gathered in a huddle, you know and came away, and I love this, uh, with a sweet conclusion that, that Dead End in Norvelt would be the recipient of the 2012 John Newberry Medal for the most distinguished contribution. Can I, oh, I have to repeat that. For the most distinguished <laughs> contribution to American literature for children. I mean, what could be more blessedly formal than the honorific phrasing stamped upon that gleaming golden medal? Oh, I love it but I'll have to purchase a monstrance and put the metal in it and sit it on my, my writing desk. I'll have to go down to the All Things Religious store and get one of those. <laughs> and I need to thank all my readers for the tall pillar. Really, it is a very lovely pillar tonight. A tall pillar, thank you readers. And I stand on that pillar. And now we actually have a speech. But before I get to the speech, let me just say this. <laughs> um, I worked at uh, college. I was a professor for a while. And uh, we would give away, you know, you would give away uh, honorary PhDs. And so one year I was in charge of Jerry Lewis. And I had to give him an honorary PhD. I said, Jerry, do you have a speech? Yes, he had a speech. He had many other things too, but just the speech we'll talk about. And and so he got up there and he stood in front of an entire, you know, field full of people. And then he started with his speech and then he decided to go off road, leave the speech, go down the road into the woods and get lost. He proceeded to get really lost and uh, he didn't know how to find his way back to the speech. 
But he had it out. He had a coal card, and that was, you know, that nutty professor laugh? He just threw his head back and gave the nutty professor laugh. Everyone stood and cheered, and he walked off. That was it. I'm like, dang, that was swift. A couple years later, I get James Earl Jones. James, he brings a speech. It looks like a phone book. He said, mmm, mmm, mmm. It's going over this thing. I'm like, wow, he can memorize that much stuff? And then he gets up there, and then he goes, oh, let me just depart here for a moment. And he goes off into the bushes someplace, never to be seen again. So he has his whole card, and he throws his head back, goes, let the force be with you. Every right, cheer. <laughs> He's like, wow, that's so, you know. I'm like, wow, that's working again, you know. So I'm sitting around thinking, well, what's mine? You know, if I go off-road here, you know, everyone wants me to go off-road. I'm like, okay. You know, and I'm thinking, well, can I get back to you on that? Is that, you know, is that the only thing I can do? So, we'll see. Okay. That's it. Okay, given the ceremonial uh, tone of this occasion, I really feel as if I should be wearing a tuxedo. I should be. But instead, I'll just structure this talk in the tuxedo of literary genres, the obituary. <laughs> I mean, why not? After all, the tuxedo has long been the fancy pajama choice for the eternal thereafter. The formality of an obituary dictates that it begin with the announcement of a death, then continue with a short bio, a list of survivors, and a notice of final viewing, and ends where, with, cash donations or royalties can be dropped off. <laughs> the obit is a very tidy literary form and one that dead ends Miss Volker generously stretched to include some meteoric moment in history that magnified, magnified the life of the deceased in order to point out how in life we might feel like a speck of dust on the planet. But in truth, we are all tied together in one massive hand-holding of humanity, for better or for worse. For example, just pick this day, right? June 24th. What could make this so magnificent in history? Why, in 1509, Henry VIII was crowned today. You know, you could just pluck him right out of the air like that. <laughs> that said, I cannot assume everyone has read my recent horn book article, Mausoleum Madness, in which I detail my final resting place, and so I will paraphrase myself here. Upon noticing one day that Walt Whitman had a mausoleum, I wanted one too, who wouldn't? And so um, I have designed mine thusly. On a hill, on a small hillock of grass will be standing a tombstone in the shape of an eight foot granite book mounted on an ebony threshold. On the book is a keyhole. My daughter, Mabel, will have a large cast iron key. When she misses me, which will be often, she will insert the key into the lock and pull it open, revealing a passage of stairs leading into a heated granite library. One wall of the library will be filled, lined with shelves filled with my collected works. When she touches a volume, ding, a light from the ceiling will project a hologram of me onto a small stage, and I will read from that selected volume. For her listening pleasure and comfort, there will be a lovely Le Corbusier lounge chair and a small beverage refrigerator filled with Mexican Coca-Colas. In addition to the above, there will now be a wall button, a wall button in the shape of the golden Newberry Medal that she can push and that will deliver this portion of the Newberry speech, which begins with my voice saying, Dear Mabel, when I was a child, when I was a child, I realized that a book was an object you held in your hands, and when you read it, all the theater of the text of the book took place within the stage of the mind. This caused me to go stand in front of the mirror where I only saw the outline, the little outline of a small boy body. But when I closed my eyes, when I closed my eyes, I saw the inside of myself, 
my mind and emotions and passions, hopes, dreams, and the ever-growing, ever-changing, ever-invented fictional self in there. And I liked that fictional self. The playful mutations of the self were as endless as a vast library of books and mirrors. In short, whatever I read, I could then close my eyes and become. And when I was called to dinner, then I would open my eyes and take my seat and eat like the young boy I was. The town of Norvelt, Pennsylvania, where I was born, is similar in construction. It may be a town and not a boy, and it may have streets for boundaries rather than skin, but within the town are people shifting around like movable type and constantly gathering to spell and unspell the stories of their lives. It didn't take me long to realize the town itself was a vital living book, just an unwritten book. And like the fiction spooling round and round within the boy, the town too had an interior engine of fiction sitting upon its great foundation of history. And I liked exploring history. But since we don't have forever tonight to read Hendrik Van Loon's The Story of Mankind, the 500 plus page winner of the first Newbery Award in 1922, let's just pick one auspicious date on the calendar. Say January 23rd, Newbery Announcement Day. That's a good day. And see where that leads us. So on that day in 1737, John Hancock was born, and later he planted an English elm tree on the Boston Common. I live in Boston. In order to help block the view of the ramshackle prison from his window, it seems the Puritans were becoming less pure. That tree stood for well over a hundred years, and a man named Joseph Henry Curtis wrote a first-person autobiography from the tree's point of view, which had seen so many seasons come and go beneath its leaves. What the tree did not see was that years later, in 1974, it was there on the site where it had been planted that I did a little Snoopy happy dance when I found out I had sold my very first picture book, Rotten Ralph. But I just love that circle of history. You know, it's just it's so generous. On January 23, 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell becomes the first female medical doctor in the United States. Miss Volker wasn't a doctor, but she didn't need a degree to practice medicine. She inflicted medicine on her patients in Norvelt, and we were better for it. When she cauterized my nose with that veterinary, veterinary tool, I felt the burning conviction of that infliction. On January 23rd, 1897, Elva Zona Hurston was found dead. In court, her mother testified that the ghost of Zona returned and revealed to her that the husband had strangled Zona to death. The husband became the first and only man convicted by the testimony of a ghost and was sent to prison for life. <laughs> Somehow I knew this fact. And after my mother had found all of my Christmas gifts unwrapped in the back of her closet, I told her a ghost revealed to me that I had an evil twin who had been living in the attic and that he had done it. Moments later, I found out my mother had an evil twin. And she was the one who cracked me across the butt with a shoe tree. That hurt. On January 23, 1912, the International Opium Convention was signed at The Hague. It is the first drug control treaty that outlaws various preparations, such as hashish and all other cannabis resins not used for medical purposes. Somehow I hadn't read that fact. And in 1970, I made the mistake of smuggling 2,000 pounds of hashish on a British yacht, had to be British, British yacht from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands to New York City. That's true. After about a year and a half in prison, I got out and wrote the Rotten Ralph book that made me dance where John Hancock planted his tree. <laughs> about 30 years later, I wrote Whole of My Life about my time in prison and the power of reading and, and great literature. I've always felt, really, so impure for breaking the law and then going on to write books for innocent young readers. 
but recently my spirits were lifted when I learned that prior to winning the Newberry for Smokey the Cow Horse in 1927, Will James had been sentenced to 15 months in a Nevada state prison for cattle rustling. <laughs> Bless him. This part's great. He was released a month early as he convinced the parole board that he wanted to write books for children. <laughs> Shockingly. Wow. Then in 1928, the Newberry runner-up was Ella Young, who earlier had been convicted of smuggling guns to Republicans during the Irish Easter Uprising. Once released, she crossed the ocean to the U.S. At Ellis Island, she was detained. It looked like her past had finally caught up to her, but when she told her examiners that she believed in fairies, she was instantly welcomed into the United States. where she wrote The Wondersmith and His Son. Now there are other stories, other stories of the slippery lives of Newberry winners. <laughs> but this is my obituary and the only dirt I'm supposed to dig up is my own. So let's push on. On January 23rd, 1930, Clyde Tombaugh photographs the planet Pluto. He feels jubilant. In 2006, Pluto is downgraded from a planet to a dwarf chunk of ice. He feels deflated. I've had book reviews that were equally as dispiriting. On January 23rd, 1941, Charles Lindbergh testified to Congress that the U.S. should sign a neutrality pact with Germany, which had already blitzkrieg Poland. The patron saint of Norvelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, fabulous Eleanor, was against such a treaty. Wisely, Congress was against it too. But I wasn't so wise when years later I signed a truce with my older sister. It was called the No More Bickering Treaty. <laughs> this went well for a time until her constant kindness got under my skin. And one afternoon when she was sleeping, I took one of my cockroach friends, Zippy, and dropped him into her open mouth. She was bigger than me, and to punish me, she made me remove my clothes and run naked around the outside perimeter of the house. I went sprinting out the back door without a stitch on. I ran screaming blindly as I circled the house, utterly terrified of being seen by our psychopathic neighbors who might have ripped off their own clothes while thinking we were throwing a wild party. When I reached the back door, my sister had locked it and all the other doors and windows. I then ran to the neighbor's yard to pull laundry off the line, ladies things, and was caught by the lady who called me a pervert as I hopped away like a shaved rabbit, hands cupping my crotch to my yard where I hid in the bushes. In the evening, when I was missed for supper, my father went outside to hunt for me and summed up the situation. He found me hiding under a shrubbery. Never trust your sister, he said. She's smarter than you and unscrupulous. <laughs> What's unscrupulous mean, I asked. Like I said, he said dryly, she's smarter than you. <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of things we can say about January 23rd. On and on and on they go. But I better get to this one. I could continue really telling more January 23rds, but, but, you know, let's get to the one that we all are thinking about. That would be my favorite January 23rd. That would be this year. So early in the morning of January 23rd, 2012, I was in the kitchen feeding our cat, Scooch, some treats and glancing suspiciously at my cell phone. <laughs> I was trying not to think what I was thinking, which is a hard thing to do, because the more you try not to think about it, of course it doubles in size in your mind. Because really what had happened was the week before, the week before Roger Sutton had called me and I had received the or was awarded the Scott O'Dell Prize for Historic Fiction. So, so that had opened the possibility of, of the Newberry. 
So, it was toying with me, like the fruit that Tantalus could never reach or the water he could never drink. To distract myself, I was reading This Day in History in the column in the Boston Globe. It was the birthday of Captain Chesley Sullenberger, the captain who successfully landed U.S. Air Flight Flight 1549 on the Hudson River. The nation's spirits were floated by this skillful accomplishment, and I thought, would my spirits float or sink? <laughs> and then the phone rang. I stared at it and thought, if this is my mother calling to tell me again where she hid her life insurance policy, I'm going to put that policy to work immediately. I picked up the phone. It was not my mother. It was Vicki Ash and a chorus of very excited voices in the background. Very excited, raucous. Could hardly make them out, just huge sounds of noise, happiness. And, I, and, and, in, and she told me, and I think, but I was not sure because of this noise you all were making. <laughs> I wasn't sure. She told me, I think, but I wasn't sure of the, that Dead End in Norvelt had been chosen as the John Newberry book for 2012. After an oddly long silence, Vicki asked, do you have anything to say? <laughs> I must have been stunned, but I was. I did. I, w I was totally stumped. I wanted to ask if I'd won the gold or silver because, because I wasn't quite sure I'd heard her correctly because of all the noise. And I hesitated, to, and I thought, well, it would be rude to ask for a clarification, you know. So, so I just perked up and said, why, thank you. I'm very thrilled that I wrote a book about history that made history. Thank you so much. There were more cheers, lots of cheers, more giddy conversation. Um, then I was sworn to secrecy, not to tell anyone except my editor, Wes. And then I was told about the live webcast in two hours, and then a flash call was over. And I was just standing there. And then my wife read my confusion and asked, well? <laughs> and, and I looked at her and I said, I'm not sure if I won the gold or the silver. <laughs> She looked at me and said, of course you won the gold, she said. I'm sure they're very specific when they call. <laughs> but maybe they did tell me it was the silver, and I just didn't hear it correctly. I heard only what I wanted to hear, which happens a lot for me. <laughs> I said, when I won the silver for Joey Pigs, people were cheering. Maybe, maybe I should call Vicky back. <laughs> no, my wife insisted. You, of all people, have a history of doing stupid things. <laughs> Don't embarrass yourself. Call Wes. <laughs> He'll straighten you out. Wes. Mwah. I called. Wes was in the shower, but luckily he was using his cell phone for a bar of soap. <laughs> I think I won the Newberry, I said. No way, he said wetly. <laughs> that was not the response I was looking for, Wes. Well, to tell you the truth, I only think I did. I said, I I'm not totally sure. <laughs> of course he won it, my wife cut in. It went on this way, really, it went on this way. Him in the shower, me in a quandary, my wife absolutely certain as always. She and I both went back to bed, turned on our laptops, the cats joined us, and in about two hours we watched the live feed, and there it was, dead end in Norveld had actually won. I know. It was the very last book announced. <laughs> it just squeaked in, I said to my wife. No, they saved the best for last, she said, you fool. I was grinning like one. You were right, I said to her. No kidding, she replied. For the entire history of our marriage, I've been right. <laughs> I should remember that, I said, so I'm not so stupid again. Write it down, she suggested. <laughs> and then the phone rang, and it rang, and it rang all day, that phone rang. And that night, I was lying in bed thinking, this day in history, Jack Antos received the Newberry Medal for Dead End in Norvelt. And I haven't stopped thinking about it, or talking about it. <laughs> right, Mabel? 
And now we cut back to Mabel in the mausoleum library. She presses the golden button. My voice stops. The speech ends. The hologram of me is vanished. And she stands and exits into the fresh air. She gets into her car. And amazingly, the same cast iron key fits her ignition switch. And she zooms off. But wait, 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 wait a minute. Really, I'm not dead yet. Not yet. I'm getting there. I'm still alive and talking. I've broken my own rules of obituary writing and once again created a fiction of myself, which is typical Gantosian writing, since my motto is all me all the time. <laughs> For a real obituary, you need a corpse and not just a corpus of work. And as Mark Twain said after reading his obituary in the New York Journal, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. And this is how history works. It's one infinite ball a bailing wire connecting each bit of information, big or small, animal or human, to each other. Just as I always thought it was when I was a boy and I closed my eyes in the mirror and saw it all. Which simply means I get to close my eyes again and write many more books. I thank each of you, each of you for this wonderful occasion and this lifelong award. Good night and go read in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.